howdy, friendly neighborhood calculus teacher back again, talking about topic five this time. This topic is called tables and Riemann sums. Now, you may have noticed a little bit, this, little bit of this already, but there is overlap. So you won't only have a Riemann sum question with a table, but you will always have a Riemann sum question with the table. Hopefully that came out right. In my brain, that sounds backwards. Moving on. When we're talking about Riemann sums, you need to be proficient with both left, midpoint, and right Riemann sums and trapezoid. Those are not Riemann sums, but they are an approximation method similar to Riemann sums. I encourage you always, anytime you do this, I think it's worthwhile to write out your x or y axis and then use that to study your intervals. Furthermore, you are often asked when talking about left, midpoint, and right Riemann sums, mostly the left and the right, if you have an over or under approximation. Similarly, with the trapezoidal, you'd have an over or under approximation. The left and right Riemann sums depend upon the behavior of the function. If you're doing a Riemann sum over an increasing interval, so the function is increasing, say from zero to three, and you're doing a left Riemann sum, you would under approximate. If you do a right Riemann sum, you would over approximate. If the function is decreasing, those are reversed. The left will, un will over approximate and the right will under approximate. It's hard to say for the midpoint, it's hard to say. For the trapezoid, it has nothing to do with the increasing or decreasing function. It has to do with the concavity of a function because the trapezoid top is like similar to a secant line, which is like, a, yeah, a little, bit, a little bit like a tangent line, kind of, maybe, I don't know. So it has to do with concavity. So any kind of approximation question can happen with a table. You may have to do a derivative approximated as a rate of change, for example. A lot of times you'll have intermediate value theorem or mean value theorem or rules theorems with tables. Again, these are not restricted to table questions, but you do need to know how to do these with table questions. Often these will be contextualized problems, so make sure you are strong with your interpretation including units. And when you're doing these Riemann sums, trapezoid sums, approximations, anything, make sure you show your setups. If you just have the correct answer, you are unlikely. I would say 99 times out of 100 to get full credit. So at least show your setups. Here then is the question we're working on today. And again, I encourage you to work on this. I will show you my work and then go through the scoring guidelines after you've tried it. So this is a non-calculator question. And as per usual, about 15 minutes of work. If it takes you a lot longer than 15 minutes, then that's a yikes and you're gonna to wanna to check in on that. Anyway, my work will be next. So, Continuing with my work, I have to explain why there must be a value r on the interval one, three, such that h of r equals negative five. Now it doesn't always mean there must be a value, use a theorem, but often that's a good indicator. So I looked at this and it said h of r equals negative five. And I thought about the intermediate value theorem. I thought about the derivative, if I could do that, so I would need um, for h of x, I would need an integral here that's going to be impossible. So I was like, okay, it's got to be the intermediate value theorem. So that means h has to be continuous on the closed interval. h is because f and g are differentiable. Consequently, the intermediate value theorem applies. Now, we need to make sure that we consider h at one and h at three, because negative five has to be between these for us to have a conclusion. If negative five is not between these function values, we don't have a conclusion. We say, well, maybe. But 
as h of one is three, and I got that by replacing x with one, reading the table for g, getting g of one, which is two, doing f of two, again from the table, f of two is nine, so I got three. Repeat the process, this time x is three. I can write my conclusion. So h of r, which is negative five, is between three and negative seven. There is at least one x value r on the open interval, one, three, so that h of r equals negative five. Letter B, I'm like, I just did the intermediate value theorem here. I'm probably not using the intermediate value theorem again. So I thought about the mean value theorem. I could have tried Rolle's theorem, but mean value theorem always works. Rolle's theorem only works if your average slope is zero. So again, H is composed of differentiable functions, F, G, and negative six. That means H is continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval. So the mean value theorem applies. Then I calculate the average rate of change using H, the values I got from before. I give me a negative 10 divided by two, that's negative five. There exists at least one X value R on one, three, so that H prime of R equals negative five. Part C. Let W be the function given by W is that that is an integrally defined function, which means when I take the derivative of W, the derivative and the antiderivative cancel out, but I have to remember the chain rule. That means I need to multiply F of G of X by G prime of X and F of one by zero. Make sure you are current on your fundamental theorem of calculus skills. So that's where this formula comes from. F of G times G prime, F of one times zero, that ends up being zero. When X is three, G is four, that comes from the table. So I need to do F of four times two, two is G prime of three also comes from the table. F of four is negative one, that's why that's negative two. Letter D. One of the topics you need to make sure that you try to remember, it's typically one question, but it's still worth thinking about is inverse functions. Remember, functions and inverse functions have reciprocal slopes at corresponding points. What do I mean by corresponding points? I mean, when X is two in the inverse, Y is two in the original function. That's why, the first thing I always do is write down the point pairing. G inverse of two is one, G of one is two. That's where that comes from. So I said, again, two is an X value in G inverse. That means two is a Y value in G. So I looked at G, G is two right here. The X value of two for G is one. So G goes through the point one, two. G inverse goes through the point two, one. So G prime of one is five. That means G inverse prime of two is one fifth. The corresponding points are two, one in the inverse and one, two in the original function. The equation of the tangent line then uses G inverse prime of two, which is one fifth and the point two comma one because that is the point in G inverse. And again, the hardest part here was the pre-calculus, not the calculus. We got to remember, I know I'm repeating this for a third time. That should tell you how important it is that you remember this fact. If I have an X value in the inverse of a function, that is a Y value in the original function. So that means I need to use this Y value in the original function to solve for the X value, be it a table, an equation, or a graph, doesn't matter. Once I've done that, and I know that G has the point one, two, G inverse has the point two, one. Scoring guidelines. For part A, you'd earn one point for the correct values of H of one and H of three. I believe without the correct values of H1 and H3, you're not getting the conclusion point using the IVT. Notice how carefully this is written. If you don't write it this carefully, you are unlikely to get that point using the IVT. Make sure you name the theorem. When it applies that the function is continuous and or differentiable as usual, 
And for the IVT, your extra piece is this interval showing that H of three is less than the value of H you want is less than H of one. For part B, you get one point for calculating the average rate of change of H. So that uses the H values from part A and you get negative five. Now, if you were to have done this using your wrong values of H of one and H of three, you would get that first point here. I don't think you would be eligible though for the second point. Part C, W prime of three, they jumped right into it. It's F of G of three. So remember I did an extra piece there. That's because I'd like to remind you that when we're looking at an integrally defined function, the integral and derivative cancel out, but you need to remember to multiply by the thing you evaluate the function at because that is the inside part of the function. Therefore, the chain rule applies. One point for applying the chain rule, one point for ending up with negative two. Part D, you get no points if you do not identify G inverse of two as one. None. But once you've done that, I think all the rest of the points are essentially free. So again, the pre-calculus piece, yes, a fourth time and a fifth time. The most important thing is remembering the pre-calculus. Two is an X value for G inverse. That means two is a Y value for G. So I have to use my table in this case, but I could equally use a graph or an equation to solve for X when Y is two. Remember that relationship between the inverse, the calculus, we proved the derivative function and the derivative of the inverse function have reciprocal slopes at corresponding points. And then the tangent line, like I said already, free puntos. Thank you very much for your attention and very much for all of those repetitions of inverse function derivatives. See ya next time.